back to the Best Fleets Podcast. For this episode, we're joined by John Saunders and Mike Frolick from Transpro Freight Systems. They're a longtime participant and nine-time winner in the Best Fleets program. I hope you enjoy this program and hope you subscribe either via YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Enjoy. John, Mike, welcome to the show. Uh, really honored to have you on the show today. And uh, and being a 10-time participant in the Best Fleets uh program we're we're really excited about uh about transpro being part of it today thanks for having us chris it's uh, it's an honor and a uh, privilege to be a uh, part of the program and uh uh this is my first uh uh podcast uh john I, i'm not sure about you but yeah i had the pleasure last year of being on road dog radio which was a uh, truckle carrier association carriers edge uh, uh initiative uh, and it was wonderful so we're happy to be back uh, and happy to be representing the 150 uh, team members that make up Transpro Freight Systems. That's awesome. Um, so we got a lot of topics to cover today. Um, being part of the Best Fleets program for 10 years, uh, you've done a lot, in, in, not only in you know being part of that program, but also doing all great things within your company to be recognized as a Best Fleet. So just to start off for our viewers and listeners, can you provide a, a, a brief bio history of Transpro and, and also your individual bios? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, regarding Transpro, uh, mm -hmm. so Transpro was uh, uh, founded back in 1989, where they went from approximately a 3,000 square foot facility to 10,000 to 25, and now uh, currently at a, you know, a state-of-the-art 100,000 square foot uh, facility uh, cross stock. Uh, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, our business model was uh, uh, really uh, designed as a LTL uh, carrier, uh, primarily uh, uh, running international, and um, and it continued to flourish um, with our, uh, uh, our through our captive. Uh, we've uh, uh, continued, uh, you know, to have uh, best practices in the fleet, and uh, during that time. Um, I'm sure there were some conversations with our previous owners and our current president, Mark Seymour, uh, of uh, Crisco Transportation Group. And uh, because those two companies aligned, um, the uh, conversations uh, continued on and uh, understanding uh, how we worked and having very similar um, family uh, values. Mm -hmm. uh, Transpro was acquired back in 2015 under the KTG family. And um, it allowed us to uh, uh, combine our strengths and uh, move forward in the uh, transportation business. Yeah, there was a big splash when that acquisition happened. Uh, so, um, and it looks like it's just continued to flourish since then. Um, John, your background. So you you had uh, uh, you have a, a pretty decent uh, history in, in transportation, but also outside of transportation. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. You know, look, uh, for me, it was uh, a corporate finance and merger and acquisition background and doing mm -hmm. some work in uh, uh, private equity with healthcare companies and uh, transportation companies. And it was, uh, you know, I got to meet a number of uh, trucking companies along the way and, and the, uh, had a real pleasure to join Polaris Transportation Group. Uh, I was there for five years and had the chance to work with uh, several very talented people that uh, taught me a lot about uh, uh, transportation and logistics and warehousing. Uh, June's a big month for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, two and a half years ago, joined uh, Transpro Freight Systems. And look, Transpro Freight Systems is, you know, one of the largest cross-border LTL carriers, uh, a prominent um, produce backhauler working for a lot of Fortune 50 companies. And so this is, this is a, you know, a really great business. I'm, I'm proud to lead it now. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, Chris, like my bio is going to go, uh, we're, we're adding to it now uh, with, uh, I'm working hard to get my AZ license. Nice. Uh, so, uh, you know, an initiative that started in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, I ultimately failed in uh, December 2019. Uh, uh, or some people say I partially passed. Uh, and I had intended <laughs> to go back and do it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, but with 2020 and COVID, um, you know, we had our priorities and we weren't really deviating with, uh, with special projects and we're back, that's back on the, the board now. Uh, 
And, you know, it's great. I, I, you know, I'm learning more about the, the challenges that our drivers have. I'm learning more about the educational system that they get introduced to our industry through. Um, and every day I try, you know, when I went for the first um, uh, AZ test, uh, Mike Frolick uh, took me. Uh, we did it in a TransPro truck. I mean, everyone's there with day cabs and small trailers. I did it with a full highway tractor, uh, you know, full-size trailer. Um, and, you know, Mike was getting really excited seeing that I was doing quite well, and I, and I was. And so, you know, when I pulled back in to go through the backing maneuver, uh, Mike pulled out his camera to start recording it uh, to, to sort of capture the moment of greatness. Uh, and then, you know, proceeded to tape 10 minutes of me flopping around like a fish trying to get it between the the pylon. So I continue to try to buy that video from Mike uh, and that's <laughs> blackmail. Uh, it's, not, it's not for sale. He tells me, but you know, the offer keeps going up. So it's yeah, on the deep point, web. You know, I, I hope th this video does not cut and that is played. Uh, but you know, Cue the I, video. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to, sort of, I wanted to round up my bio with, uh, you know, that's certainly, you know, my, my entrance to, to trans pro and, and the education never ends. That's awesome. It's a good initiative. Do you have a, a deadline for for you to achieve that next uh, milestone in your career? Uh, I don't have. I don't know. I don't have deadlines. <laughs> I want to get it done. I'll tell you that that uh, the drivers here have been incredibly supportive. It is hands down the number one question I get uh, every time we have uh, a meeting. Uh, is when are you getting back in? Uh, you know, everyone. It's you know, everyone's been a wonderful help to me in our yard with. Uh, you know, working through the various maneuvers. Uh, you know, I get called on to shunt trailers during busy periods. Uh, and then they tease me that it'll take me four hours to do it. Um, but, you know, so it's worked out great. And, uh, and I think everyone appreciates it. And, but, I, but I know that at some point here, uh, a good initiative will turn against me if I don't get it done pretty soon. So. Oh, kudos. So the better. Kudos. Um, and Mike, a little bit about your bio personally. Well, um, my bio, well, I started off as a, as a driver, a commercial driver, uh, driving primarily in the GTA, mm -hmm. uh, doing a courier and then cartage, uh, you know, containers and uh, flatbed and whatnot, and eventually uh, moving, uh, crossing the border as well. Um, mostly Canada, but I did do a fair amount of U.S. as well. Um, and then my career went from, uh, that to also helping out my, uh, former, uh, safety, I guess, mentor. Uh, and I was doing, uh, forklift, uh, uh, training and logs and road evaluations. And then I was just, uh, uh, programmed into, uh, helping them out more. And, uh, then, um, uh, moved into a safety and compliance role with a, uh, um, uh, in another uh, uh, role, and uh, at the end, um, I had a chance to work for an international carrier, which is Transpro. Mm -hmm. And as of uh, June 8th, I've been here 14 years and counting. Nice. So, nice. Uh, and I think I've known you all of those 14 years. So we yes, you have. We connected it's, very early on in your career with Transpro. It's for, it's absolutely, and it's funny how you know. Uh, um, after all these years, and I've always said as big as trucking is, it's a very small family. Uh, you never know when you're going to run into somebody. And, uh, and it's great to see uh, so many people that we know that are still in it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, and so moving on to your involvement with best fleet. So in our introduction, we talked about you being a 10 time participant, nine time winner in the best fleets program. Can you recall how you were introduced to Best Fleets? So what got you thinking about it and how you got involved? Like it was yesterday, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know if you, you'll probably remember this. I remember the first time I met you and Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, we went to lunch uh, at Kelsey's and you were explaining the uh, buy-down program for the drivers. Right. And it was a little, uh, a little foggy to me at that time. So you guys were actually educating me on it. And it was through our... Uh, our relationship uh, through uh, uh, NAL that uh, that came about, and uh, I was lured to the program, and we discussed it here at Transpro, talking about you know how many really cool things that we do, and it was a great platform for us to tell our story. So we uh, we put the application in, and uh, uh, and I guess as they say, the rest is history. 
Nice. So really, it was it was you uh, after all those years of being in there that uh, you know it brought brought it to light and, and to the forefront for us. Well, you you definitely took the ball and ran with it for sure. So I remember that first. I think it was Texas when you guys uh, accepted your first uh, winners. That's plaque. right. So that's yeah. right. Yeah, twenty fourteen. Yeah. Um, so for those who aren't familiar or have not participated, for those who are watching or listening today, um, you know, talking about the value of the program and, and what it provides to your company, thinking of it from a framework of a feedback loop, what would you tell those people or those carriers that are considering getting involved? And, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this one. For, you know, I'll start, Chris, and, and just say that, the program is something that, that drives continuous improvement within our organization, first and foremost. You know, it's something that uh, it is part of the fabric of uh, management discussions on a monthly basis. Uh, you, know, what, you know, what did we do last year? What are we doing this year? Uh, you know, are we living up to the commitments that we've made? Uh, are some things uh, working the way that we anticipated? Are some things not working the way that we anticipated and, and adjusting on the fly? Uh, you know, we're very mindful of the fact that, you know, yes, we've won it many years, um, but we don't feel like there's an inertia there. Uh, we feel like we have to win every year, uh, you know, without sort of the benefit of previous years. And so, you know, what are we doing? And uh, that ties in nicely with, you know, making uh, a nice environment for our drivers uh, for Transpro and, and making this a place that they choose to work. Uh, and want to come to work. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's a high level of, of what Best Fleets, you know, means to us and, and how we live and breathe it on a daily basis here at TransPro. And so based on my observations of the past, and this is prior to my time with, uh, with Carrier's Edge and Best Fleets, I could see having participated in a number of your driver meetings, both orientation and your uh, semi-annual meetings was, you know, you, you make open communication a priority. So there's some people that kind of give lip service to it and some that actually do it. So one thing that I, a couple of things that I pulled out of your questionnaire from Best Fleets was um, you, the formation of a driver committee and the uh, increase of the intervals of meeting this year to, to monthly. So I, I'm assuming those are now virtual meetings or have were virtual meetings during uh, during the COVID uh, period of time. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the function of those driver committees? Yeah, Chris, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, it was, it was working really well and, you know, due to COVID, you know, we made a, a decision not to, um, and I'm, I'm trying to use the word carefully, not to overload them mm -hmm. uh, just because of COVID times we felt uh, because we have so much communication going on with them on so many different levels um, and really the amount of things that we were finding, it was like our health and safety committee. We've got it on this month, it's gone next month. So the, the list kept getting smaller and smaller. So we were comfortable moving back to quarterly uh, with mm -hmm. them. However, if they felt that they needed to address something, you know, they didn't have to wait three months to call us. They could, they could do it right away. Uh, the nice part of that meeting is, uh, you know, we take that and every single morning, John quarterbacks our managers' meetings like clockwork mm -hmm. uh, with every manager in, in our company. And uh, there's so many different things that we discuss. So when we have those meetings and we bring it uh, to forefront, uh, it's addressed real time. It's not like, okay, we'll get back to you in three to six weeks. We all have the same information. We can address it. Uh, you know, we have uh, other staggered calls throughout the week uh, in different departments. Um, and we put a program in place to, to address those. So there's really, over time, there's less things that are coming up. Mm -hmm. Chris, we, we found, you know, at the, when COVID initially, you know, came into our world, uh, into our lives, um, the, the rate of change of information that we were getting, uh, the changes we were getting on a daily basis, yeah, you know, we were holding at least one call a day, sometimes two, just to address, um, you know, what our collective response was going to be. You know, you sort of rewind. Now it seems, you know, normal, but you rewind. Uh, and, you know, we were planning trucks to go to California or, or certain states, and it was unsure if the receivers were going to be there to receive the freight. And so, 
Uh, you know, what, what Mike just outlined, I think, is, is the rate of communication got to be, you know, daily, twice a day. Um, and when you get into that frequency of communication and care, you know, because we're, a net, you know, like we'd be announcing on one call, right? We're going to have PPE available for you in your mailboxes. And the next one is, you know, let us know if uh, any receivers aren't, uh, you know, permitting you to stay on site. Let us know if there's any any changes to some of the infrastructure that we've relied on for years uh, that, that now was um, in question. Uh, and so, you know, I would just, I would just sort of add to Mike's comments that it's not that we went from, you know, having a meeting to sort of restaging it to, to quarterly or what have you. It's that th these were addressed in real time in the moment. And like you said, you know, we are a transparent company. We do things in an above board manner and in a collaborative way. You know, our drivers are business partners. Um, and so it wasn't something that, you know, it, this, the information that we had to get out to them, you know, in many ways couldn't wait a month. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that would be sort of how we handled it. And I think our drivers really appreciated it. You know, the guys, you know, we, and we've done different things to try to join, you know, join them on this journey. You know, we completed a virtual ride along, which is where, you know, I, I couldn't go with the driver, but, you know, they took, you know, sent me photos of every stop and photos of their trip. And this is what I'm doing now to give me a, you know, a, a you know, a point of view perspective of what they're, what they're going through. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that was the, that was the four point. I don't feel anyone feels that, um, uh, that they weren't heard. So that was sort of what came of those meetings was, uh, and, and thankfully we had that infrastructure in place. If we're going to have these meetings, there's a way for us to meet, there's a group, uh, but the group ended up becoming everyone. Yeah. I think one of the silver linings to COVID, especially for the trucking community is carriers were able to exercise some communication muscles that they weren't forced to do in the yeah. past. And I, I think the remnants will, will stay there for forever. So they've been able to use technology in a different way, whether it's Zoom, Facebook Live, YouTube. We have people's, people with their own channels, with their own podcasts now. So yeah. that's really cool to see. One of the things that I also picked up on, on through your questionnaire was the driver liaison role. Uh, does How does that role work and what are their main functions? So that driver liaison, Chris, is, uh, you know, it's almost like an in-between of, of our meetings as well. So, you know, if a driver um, might uh, uh, feel more comfortable talking to one person as opposed to 10, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they want to be anonymous and that's okay too. Um, we just want them to come forth with, with their information so, you know, we can, we can address those, uh, those concerns. So um, we have, uh, you know, our, our driver's uh, lounge, and there's also a window which actually chat attaches to uh, uh, another office, and that person can come at any given time. They can actually even call them and address those concerns. Um, and on so many different levels, they could say, you know, I, I need some more load bars, or I wouldn't mind some, some golf shirts, or, uh, or whatever the case may be. That driver liaison is... Uh, it's not necessarily a standalone position, uh, but it is a dedicated person that uh, they can go to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the drivers know that they can, uh, you know, they can slide that window open and, and, and talk to that person uh, or, or call them. And, uh, you know, they'll pass that information on to uh, management. And as a, as a collective group and team, we will uh, address those concerns and get back to that driver. So uh, we think there had to be some, there had to be one person if at all possible, I mean, someone if have, accountable. Yeah, just somebody that could help uh, help them and, and listen to them. Where uh, you know maybe some other departments maybe could be year end and are trying to close things out. Uh, not that they didn't want to have time, but you, you need a go to person. So who could I talk to? And and we've had that for a while now, and it's it's been successful. The driver liaison role became, you know. We certainly helped that role gain some gain some traction. You know, a year ago we had our customers really, and even still to today. I mean, but but certainly back then, you know, we had customers donating product to us to give to drivers, uh, and so I think that really helped us, you know, position that that function in the company. Is all of a sudden, you know, they're the, they were the ones okay, you know, managing PPE, man, managing concerns that drivers had managing getting the flow of, of customer goodwill uh, uh, contributions to them. 
Uh, and, and I think that's put us in the perfect spot to then have that be a free flow of information back. You know, hey, I appreciate you giving me this. You know, I didn't appreciate this. Or, um, you know, what, what would have been better is this. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's their, that's the function is to sort of bring those, those opportunities for us back uh, to give drivers uh, the voice they deserve. Uh, and that, and I would say that role has been highly successful in us, you know, with retention and, and uh, new driver acquisition for sure. Yeah, it's one of the things that we pick out in a lot of the questionnaires and, and survey submissions from all participants is drivers of, and I guess human beings love having the loop close. So it's one thing to, ex to get the feedback, but to do something with it. So on the flip side with other participants, um, you'll see some co drivers comment that, uh, you know, they let me say whatever I want, but nothing happens. Fair enough. And, and, and if you don't, if you don't have a method to close that loop and having someone accountable, I think is a very good idea and something that uh, our viewers should take note of if they don't have someone in that role. So that's uh, good on you guys. Now you guys have been part of the Crisca transportation group for five years. And one of the things that I've ob observed through Transpro and other uh, divisions of Crisca is it doesn't operate uh, like some, um, uh, you know, kind of consolidation uh, plays for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. So you're a lot more collaborative. So I kind of, when I hear about you guys talking about how you work together, it almost sounds like captive or benchmarking type groups where mm -hmm. you guys get together on a specific topic or departments get together and talk about things that are working, not mm -hmm. working. Can you guys talk a little bit about some of those things that you've benefited from as being part of the Crisca organization? Sure. Well, uh, allow me to start. For those who aren't familiar with the Crisco Transportation Group, uh, you know, it, it's a Canadian entity uh, that's owned by Mark Seymour uh, and Murray Mullen. And mm -hmm. Murray uh, is part of a publicly traded uh, company, Mullen Transportation. Uh, it was founded in 2014. It's now, it started out as uh, the, the uh, bringing together of Crisco uh, Transportation and Mill Creek uh, mm -hmm. and is now uh, fast forward is now 11 uh, operating companies big, uh, which is quite substantial. Uh, it's a mix of full load, uh, LTL, brokerage, intermodal. Uh, so uh, the full menu uh, transportation warehousing in a, in a significant way. Uh, so it's, it is, it's uh, you know, really all modes. Uh, and so the customers have benefited from that. Uh, so Transpro is one of the 11 operating companies. We all run independently. I'm the general manager of Transpro Freight Systems, and there's another, there's, you know, 10 other general managers that run their respective operating company, and we all report into Crisca Transportation Group. Uh, uh, and, you know, the immediate impacts of being associated with a company like uh, Crisca Transportation Group are the, are the obvious ones, Chris. Like, uh, you know, we, we buy fuel better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our tractor trailer costs are better because of, of you know, the aggregation of uh, purchases. Uh, our insurance is, is better uh, by, you know, you know, negotiating as part of a larger organization. You know, our finance function, uh, our marketing costs. Um, you know, there's, there's some, you know, immediate synergies that come out of being a part of that group uh, that, that, that enhances value uh, for, you know, all stakeholders day one. Uh, I think the one that doesn't necessarily always get a lot of play is, is just the size of, of the entity. Uh, and so, you know, if you, you join a, you know, you may be a small or mid-size uh, company and you're joining, you know, our group. Uh, and immediately, you know, there's our brokerage business now is up to 70 million. So, I mean, our, our, our brokerage business, you know, if, if a new member is joining, um, uh, you know, and, they, and they're looking for freight out of certain areas, we have an immediate ability to sort of fill those gaps to keep their drivers running um, and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, we, well, we also have over, you know, you know, with thousands of customers who, uh, you know, have, are sourcing LTL in different ways that now sort of can be introduced to the various different members uh, within Crisco Transportation Group. So there's, there's some immediate cost savings. There's immediate injections of revenue uh, that come from the association. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a strong balance sheet as well. Uh, but I think that, you know, I mean, those are things that, that I appreciate on the finance 
uh, side of things and our sales team uh, appreciates. I think what our, I think what our team members appreciate the most of being a part of the, the, the broader organization of CRISPR Transportation Group is, is for the people. Uh, you know, for our drivers, there's drivers right now at, uh, at Crisco who may want to try other things or try different lanes or try different, you know, try intermodal or try LTL. Uh, and we're able to facilitate that in a very safe way uh, where, you know, people are properly handed off and given those opportunities and the freedom to go back. You know, so, uh, you know, it's, I think, you know, our ability to to play a role deeper into someone's career or journey from a driver perspective makes a real difference being a part of this, this sizable organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same for uh, office staff, uh, you know, office staff who, um, you know, may want to try different things or, or they're moving. So they want to work somewhere closer to home uh, or they, or, you know, there's a promotion opportunity. Our disp the uh, former dispatcher here at TransPro is now the operations manager at Mill Creek. Um, and, and those, that career planning and succession planning is, is done holistically as an organization. So uh, you know, there's certainly financial benefits being a part of Crisco Transportation Group, but to be you know, one of the team members, I think you, you realize the greatest benefits. Um, and so that's just a little introduction to, to Crisco and, and what it means to us. So in terms of structure of you know, formal get togethers for lack of a better yeah. term, you have, I'm assuming groups like the safety compliance groups get together regularly, the general yeah. managers get together. Can you just yeah. speak, speak to that? Sure, uh, the frequency uh, for us right now is bi-weekly for general managers uh, where, uh, and during the in early days of COVID, it was every day. Uh, so in the early days of COVID, we were constantly comparing notes, benchmarking against one another, what industries were working, what industries weren't, uh, what states were working, what states weren't. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to stay as real time, uh, as we could, uh, that's, so anyway, that's relaxed to once every two weeks, uh, we have quarterly sort of all KTG companies come together for, for an update. So we do those on a quarterly basis as if we were a publicly traded company, uh, internally at least, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll let Mike speak to, uh, the safety piece. So our, 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 uh, our get togethers, uh, Chris, um, were uh, you know we were doing it uh, twice a year, both of our all of our companies getting together, and that was quarterbacked by our director of safety uh, from KTG, uh, Eugenia Cherloff. She's doing a great job. Uh, can't say enough good things about her. She's uh, she has a lot on her plate, but we're here to support her. She she's the quarterback of the program, and uh, you know um, we uh, we try to support her as best as we can, and we would meet uh, around the same time of when we had our our. Uh, our, uh, our gap meetings, not our gap meetings, um, um, our annual uh, uh, meetings uh, with our insurance company. Mm -hmm. So um, it was uh, it was uh, it was really uh, a chance for us to get together uh, in a room and and discuss uh, the uh, uh, the events of what's going on, where we've been, where we need to go. That um, was really the uh, the captive meetings is where where, where I was referring to. Um, and then, um, we would also, I mean, she continually upgrades us with the latest information. I'd almost say daily, mm -hmm. uh, if there's an email from her during the day, it's almost like what happened to her. Um, but the, uh, we're looking at when we get our reports, uh, from the captive, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, the, the trends, uh, as not only as a group, but you know, how are we're doing as a, as, as, as a company, when I say as a company, I mean, all of us together. And uh, you know where are our strengths and where where can we improve? And we rely on each other, uh, as well as you know, with her support, you know, to put plans in place and 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 again move that needle in the opposite direction. Uh, not that we're waiting for the report, but you know, we do a lot of really good things, uh, and some things may uh, just as good as it may be. We need to continue to improve the process. We we're only as good as our last day. So, um, but uh, with that, with that plan in place uh, to see where we've been. Um, we're, we're going in the right direction there with us without, a, without a doubt. Um, you know, with, with the amount of drivers, I, I think we're up around 800, 880. Don't quote me on that number, but I think we're hovering around that number. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, that's quite a size of a fleet to, uh, to manage. Um, but, you know, we've, we have uh, collision review uh, meetings uh, 
uh, quarterly as well, which is uh, chaired by uh, Eugenie as well. And, uh, you know, if there's anything there that uh, we can all learn from, um, and it's putting our best practices together and us all succeeding together as, as one, uh, not just, you know, even though we run as standalone companies, we're all, we all have the same vision. It's everybody's passionate about safety. And, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to watch our costs, but at the same time, we want to be effective. We want to have the safest drivers on the road. Um, and, uh, you know, doing, doing the best that we can to, to, uh, support them and, uh, and the company as well. So, um, Chris, we do a lot, an awful lot of benchmarking, whether it be on a safety basis or, um, you know, across a number, I'm thinking, you know, sales quality, benchmarking, mm -hmm. uh, revenue quality, uh, benchmarking, uh, rate per mile, empty miles, you know, recently we were focused a fair amount on repair and maintenance costs per, for tractor, for trailer, uh, by, you know, by type. Uh, so, and, so on uh, that note, I, as you know, I have a deep background in, on yeah. that sort of thing. So I'm curious, do, do you have trouble in the standardization of what the inputs are um, for, for how you're benchmarking? So for example, one person's reporting parts and you know miscellaneous and the other one's yep. reporting parts and labor etc is have you kind of gotten over that hurdle i think i think how we how we stick handle that because all uh a all 11 companies operate independently and so everyone has different arrangements in place uh and so you're right it's hard to it's hard to you know always be apples to apples but at the end of the day it's money uh mm -hmm. and if someone's doing it better uh it's 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 identifiable uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking of, um, you know, we've seen through, you know, other companies, uh, you know, we had acquired a company called Trail with Transport, their empty miles was 4%. Uh, and so, you know, now they have a different network and, and customer base that enables that. But certainly, you know, when we looked at ours, ours was like uh, 12. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we said, hey, how can we get, we're not going to get to four, but how close can we get to four? Uh, and so that prompts conversations, uh, conversations with confidence. Uh, and, you know, we're now sub eight. Uh, and so that's a 30% wow. reduction <laughs> in empty miles, which, which is a lot for, you know, it saves fuel, which is great for the environment. Uh, it gets our drivers uh, turning faster, uh, which gets them uh, uh, more miles as they get back here faster. Uh, and so, you know, that's one output of the benchmarking. Uh, the other one is just general cost. You know, we were... Uh, you know, Transpro was able to grow its sales uh, last year um, by 7% in, in the pandemic year, uh, but our cost base uh, shrunk by, uh, uh, I don't want to misstate, I think it's 26%. So wow. we took a lot of cost out uh, just because we'd sort of look at, look at what our peers are doing, looking at what our productivity, you know, whether there be productivity per person, per truck, uh, per trailer, uh, and so, you know, we, we've, we've been able to demonstrate through benchmarking, you know, we've gone from operating with 300 trailers to 200 trailers just through better utilization of equipment, which obviously saves a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, money and makes better use of uh, our shop resources. So, I mean, benchmarking is a big part of what we do um, and always, and I would say it's very safe. Uh, you know, it's not, hey, I'm doing it better than you and uh, it's absolutely hey, how, how do you do it? Uh, and you know, these are some of the challenges I'm working through. How did you overcome those? Uh, and uh, and we work, and so to your point of it strikes me as a collaborative organization, I would absolutely concur that that's the case. That's and talking about the discussion piece of it, and that's what I always would, would push back when people wanted to get hyper standardized and what the inputs are in, in a benchmarking exercise is that eliminates a lot of the cool conversations yeah, and, it can be, and, and they could be productive or unproductive. So my example anecdote was, you know, we had one company that was reporting a 30 cent per mile all in maintenance costs. And yeah. you go on to find out that the owner's classic car collections in there. Sure. So on the flip, but on the flip nice. side, <laughs> but on the flip side, you, you, you talk to someone on the other end of the spectrum at, you know, 10 cents per mile. And mm -hmm. you, you find out, you know, what their part system looks like and how they how they do inventory and and how they arrange labor and what their, you know, their, their uh, standard labor costs were. So it, it's the extremes or those anomalies that drive conversation. And that's uh, that, that's really cool. It, it, it absolutely is. 
and uh, and that is what we find. And, and people do act with it uh, quickly. And a big part of that is making you know I don't have all the answers, Chris. So mm-hmm. you know a big part of it is making sure that everyone else in the organization is comfortable with those types of questions. You know these are not you know pointing the finger. These are not uh, hey what are you doing? Uh, it's you know so, you know the feedback I'm getting is this. Do you think that that works in our environment or not? And and if it might, how would it look? Uh, and so, you know, it's easy for us to talk about, you know, once a month or every two weeks. Uh, but the real secret sauce is having a company that sort of lives it and breathes it, you know, right to the bottom. And and I think that's what differentiates uh, us a bit. I love that. And 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 you can you you know this as well as I do that there's lots of companies that are on the acquisition, you know, frontier for lack of a better term. Yeah. And they're not thinking about how they can, you know, gel people together and, you know, consolidate and, and discuss. And that's a, that's the key part of the synergy. It's just not buying power. So kudos on yeah. that. Um, so moving on to uh, back to the best fleet submission uh, or your interview for 2021. Um, you mentioned a couple pivots due to COVID any, um, anecdotes you can share or, you know, some of the a kind of like a summary debrief um, of what happened over the last 18 months? Oh, what an 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> 18 years, uh, it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say um, what stands out for me is, you know, organizational alignment for us was key. Uh, we, we've had to pivot around. Um, we've, and at this point, we've had overused that word so much, but we have, we have pivoted so many different, you know, when we, we would have, um, you know, Chris, I'm thinking of, you know, our, our customer base, you know, highly diversified, highly diversified across customers, highly diversified across industries. Uh, and so, you know, how quickly do we recognize that this industry is going to slow and this one's going to move higher? Uh, and how do we pivot resources to support those individuals? Uh, those individuals may not want to ship LTL. So how quickly do we get our drivers on board with doing you know, more full loads into certain markets that they aren't typically used to going? And what education uh, do we need to extend them about those new markets so that they're, they're prepared? Uh, you know, how do we, uh, you know, when all of a sudden the restaurants were closing, you know, warehousing became much bigger than it was, you know, and we had customers who had freight you know, coming across uh, across the ocean saying, I'm just going to immediately send these 15 trailers to your, your place. I hope that's okay. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, how do you all of a sudden create a warehousing business, you know, overnight? Uh, and so when I look back, I think, I think that, you know, if anything, uh, our appetite for change, our ability to uh, digest, lead, uh, and embrace it, um, you know, today is no easier than it was, you know, 18 months ago. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, you know our, our ability to move around to do what's right for, you know, our stakeholders is, is what's proving to be, you know, our secret sauce, uh, uh, you know, 18 months later, uh, as, as, you know, we shift into different markets or shifted with different customers or, or what have you. Uh, and so it was, Communication, you know, if I look back and say, you know, what was what, what worked for us was organizational alignment that was led by communication. I would say that we had, you know, a full team of people, you know, we would lead every call with, you know, what we're about to discuss may change in an hour, may change in two hours and may change tomorrow. And so let's just get comfortable with that. Uh, and, you know, for the rest of the day, this is our focus. And then we come in, you know, the next day and say, you know, what we're going to discuss, A, you know, we'd start to call everyone safe. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't, you know, everyone's safe. We don't have any, any cases and, but this is this, you know, but we have different challenges, you know, how are we going to support, uh, these businesses? I mean, we, in those early days, we, not that we ever did that math before, but the math early on was 65% of our businesses, food, healthcare, or medical. Uh, and so, you know, we had 65% of our business that, you know, overnight just grew, uh, and then we had, you know, 35% that, uh, that was trying to figure it out. And so, you know, on one hand, we have uh, customers saying, okay, we need more, we need more, we need more. And on the other hand, we need, we have customers saying, hey, we need to think, you know, we, we have to think about this and we've got to get, you know, smarter with these, uh, 
uh, you're smarter with our supply chain and, and what we're doing and how can you help us? So, uh, you know, how do you, so we were constantly sort of appeasing, you know, both worlds. Uh, and I'm proud to say that, that we did. I mean, this is, we, we achieved, we exceed, you know, greatly exceeded sales and, and profitability budgets uh, during, uh, you know, a terrible time. You, you know, Chris, if I can just add to that, um, one of the things that we also incorporated was uh, a health checklist in Isaac. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our software that we use for the driver's electronic logging devices. And that checklist uh, basically is a check-in saying, how are you feeling today? It's right. among many other avenues that we use. Um, and they check it off. And it was, uh, the phone rang a little bit at the beginning because I don't think people under quite understood. So they said, yes, yes, yes. And we're like, okay, do you, are you okay? Are you sure? And they're like, I don't have any. And we like, okay, well then you check no. So uh, it, it's good. It's, it's fine now. But the thing was, we were looking at it that, you know, we had heard stories, not under KTG, but we had heard stories where there were drivers being tracked in the U.S., no different than U.S. being tracked in Canada. And now they got the symptoms and how do they get back home? We didn't want to see them in a hospital for 14 days where, you know, if you've got those symptoms, maybe uh, let's see how you're making out. Uh, maybe quarantine, you know, the, you know, Transpro true to this day still has a no force dispatch policy. We don't force our drivers. They basically, for the most part, get to decide when they want to go out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure we were, they were being taken care of. We did have a driver who once checked it off and said, you know, I have a little bit, but you know, we called them and we actually get a call uh, from a, a monitoring uh, system uh, that's in place that we have. And as soon as they check off that they have one of those symptoms, our phone rings within minutes. Wow. And that's that now we, what allows us now we reach out to the driver and say, hey, how are you? What can we do for you? Are you OK? Um, usually it's it might have been just something passing, but at least we know that the driver is OK or, you know, we need to check on him in four hours or eight hours or whatever the case is. We, you know, uh, touch wood, we haven't had any of those cases. Uh, but, you know, just as a, as a cautionary. So they still do that every day. We also do that in the office, um, uh, uh, company-wide, where uh, it's a, a health questionnaire. Mm -hmm. uh, either you're working from home, do you have any of the symptoms? Uh, check yes or no. And that goes into a, a, an electronic uh, uh, site. So it's captivated. We have QR code readers at our, at our door, which was uh, uh, put together uh, by, the, uh, uh, by KTG. Uh, as well as their marketing department, some really nice, colorful signs. They look very professional. So we have our visitors. They answer the questionnaire before they come come in. And then we also have uh, um, uh, Eugenia was uh, was able to get the thermometers and distribute that to all of our companies, uh, so we can take people's temperatures before they come in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and John, you know, he quarterbacked that when this first came out, uh, where you know we had probably sixty percent, fifty to sixty percent, maybe more. Uh, that are working remotely from home and we were still able to turn the wheels and be successful and, 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 uh, and, and not lose any uh, site of customer service. It, if anything, it, uh, maybe we even, even seen an improvement, uh, if I can say that. Um, but all those things we had to put in place, uh, not because we had to, but we felt it was the right thing to do. Certain things, you know, the government tells you you have to, but that's the bare minimum. We wanted to go beyond that. And uh, John did something even of recently uh, came up with was we do a rapid test in-house. Uh, anybody that was coming in, like I had the air conditioning guy come in today. So uh, we have a lady who's been trained on it. Mm -hmm. She has her personal protective equipment. It's non-evasive. Uh, they do the test and within mere minutes, uh, we can give that person their test and then they can carry on about in the building. So uh, employees are good for seven days. Any visitors coming in has to be done. So we're protecting those people are here. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're just here for a quick visit. If it's a 30 second visit, we can do it in the foyer. We can do it outside. But if you need to be in the building, uh, there is no plan B. We have to administer the test. Uh, we've been able to get those. Uh, uh, one of the lady that actually administered just uh, got some more through our chamber of commerce in, in Milton, and uh, it's another way of assuring people that we've got a, a safe office place. We changed out our cleaners. Uh, we were having uh, we had our uh, uh, had them clean uh, um, uh, sterilize the facility. 
Uh, we were getting it uh, done every two weeks. We moved that up to every week. Uh, we even took it another further step to have our air quality inspected uh, in our shop and on both of our floors. They did it in multiple locations and we passed with flying colors. We just wanted to make sure that we, we had a safe workplace for everybody to come to every day. Uh, you know, aside from what I think majority of companies mm -hmm. are doing is, you know, the wipes and the gloves, which were very difficult to find when this first came out. Um, but, you know, everybody can have that access to it now, you know, and our drivers to make sure that they're fully stocked up and supplied. And if they need more, we'll put it in their mailbox as soon as the phone call hangs up because we continue to update their mailboxes uh, with that. But there was a lot of really great things, I believe, that we put in place. You know, we've had trucks uh, uh, sanitized when, uh, you know, you know uh, if a driver was switching from one truck to another or, you know, that truck, uh, uh, you know, maybe somebody was going to purchase it. Uh, so as, as much as COVID was, you know, exciting on the outside, I don't mean exciting like in a good way, uh, we had to make sure that people were safe here. And then when they went home, it didn't affect their families either. Uh, and that was, that was everybody here, uh, regardless of your position. Uh, we needed everybody to take it serious. And they did. And we've even had actually uh, husbands and wives actually call us and saying, thank you for looking after my uh, husband or wife while they're on the road. So that, you know, that's a nice little, uh, it's nice to hear that's not why we did it. But uh, this, was, uh, this was something that we felt that we had to go a little bit above and beyond. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to do that uh, in that in that manner. And uh, uh, again, we're not just going to uh, sit on what we've uh, what we've done in the past. We're going to look to do uh, uh, different things. Um, as I've just seen in the news uh, today, it's coming out where you know Ontario is expanding the rapid test. We've been doing that for six weeks. Uh, John even actually was able to have somebody come in here every Monday and administer it for us from a pharmacist. So, uh, you know, we just took it another step further while at the same time doing a little cost saving. So it didn't compromise the program. We just found another way of doing it as, as being cost effective without um, having any, any uh, um, um, uh, lapse in the program or making it any less effective. Yeah. And you can tell through your employee engagement surveys that uh, that they definitely appreciate the degree to which you went above and beyond as a company. Um, so, uh, that, that stood out. Um, what about vaccinations? Are you guys tracking the degree to which your drivers as well as your office staff and, and your techs and mechanics are vaccinated? Is that something that you're doing internally or? Not really. You know, we, we, we have a rough idea as to where people volunteer it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's something that's top of mind. Uh, we don't necessarily feel it's our place to ask at this point. Uh, you know, uh, and so that would be, uh, if, if it turns out that we can, then we will. Uh, but at this point, it's something that we're not in a position to. And so, uh, and so we don't certainly, certainly we encourage everyone to go and get, you know, we encourage everyone to get the flu shot. We encourage everyone to go and get the vaccine. Um, uh, but no, we're, we're not in the position to ask at this point. Okay. Yeah. That was just a curiosity thing. I, we're asking everyone in that regard, what they're doing yeah. in, in terms of vaccination. So we have um, communicated those, Chris, when those bulletins have come out, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, again, I'm just going to uh, say again, Eugene has done a wonderful job uh, uh, passing that information and, you know, what other, other information we'll also share it. We're not just going to put all the uh, onus on her, uh, but as we find in more information and, you know, we pass it on to the drivers and, on multiple platforms and office staff, uh, where they can get it, um, and as it's coming about. Um, and uh, again, I agree with John. We weren't in a position to uh, ask people that. I think most people probably do want to get it, and if they didn't want to get it, as long as they're not having the symptoms. Um, yeah, our our focus is regard you know regardless, we we want to make sure that everyone here is safe. I mean, our our business is it's an LT operation, so I mean the, the business has to be functional. The the real estate has, has to be active. We wouldn't be able to function per se, uh, you know, mm -hmm. remotely in certain areas like uh, warehousing and cross docking. Uh, and so, you know, Chris, we run it as, as Mike said, as if we've had a positive case every week, you know, yep. we, we, we would run it. We would fog the building every Sunday night. We clean it every night uh, and we act as if we did. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a money thing. We pay, you know, we, we spend, freely in that regard uh, and yeah we do you know we now test uh, uh everyone we've been testing people like mike said for some time uh, and as 
And as the technology continues to expand in that area, we'll just continue to be uh, at the front. I got to believe we're at the front of this one. We, we've been pretty active throughout the whole way in terms of protecting our people, protecting ourselves. Chris, selfishly, I mean, you know, Mike and I work, you know, I'm in the, we're in the office every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be safe. Uh, you know, our families want us to be safe. And so, you know, we, we gather everyone. And before we roll out uh, an initiative, uh, we talk to everyone individually. And where we, so we can't ask how you've been vaccinated, uh, but we can say, are you comfortable with doing this? Uh, and, and you're free to say no. Uh, but uh, to the credit of the people that are here every day, uh, we get zero resistance when it comes to increasing uh, safety protocols. You know, we've, uh, just to add to, to John, you know, uh, John has uh, uh, met with department managers and, uh, you know, where maybe people might have been in cubicles. Now those cubicles are, you might have had four, now you have two people on opposite ends of those cubicles. So, uh, you know, we, everybody has masks. We, we were doing, we still have the paper ones, uh, but, uh, you know, our marketing uh, manager, uh, uh, Sean LeBlanc, uh, you know, he he designed some ones for the company, so they have their logo on them, which was nice. So you could wash them and reuse them in case you ran out of a paper one, uh, which I thought was a, a great idea. Um, and if we are traveling amongst other departments, uh, however far that may be, you are required to wear a mask in the office. Once you're back in your office station, you're fine. But if you have to move about, you're going to the washroom, you're going to the kitchen, you have to wear it. And it's a respectful thing to the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. That's not just because because of the guidelines under Ontario. Mm -hmm. We can go beyond that because we're here. We have to protect us right. so we all can come back and work together tomorrow. Good. Um, so two final questions, one for Mike, one for John. Um, so I always like to pivot it a little bit to uh, kind of your personal pursuits. And I know Mike is a big uh, golf fanatic. Um, I don't know if I'm overreaching on that. I'm probably underreaching, but um, can you – Describe for our viewers your dream golf trip, Mike. Uh, where and how many rounds? Well, I, I believe my my golf my dream golf vacation would be in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, I always wanted to go there, and I've seen you know Kapalua and a, a few other places where they've uh, they've played some of the tours. But I, I think it's just a, a beautiful island. I'd love to play there. And uh, how many rounds? I think uh, I think I'd like to play uh, as many rounds as possible uh, to the point where I wouldn't be able to pick up the club anymore. <laughs> sun up to sundown. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's and, jo it. and John, your, your, your preferred travel or your, your dream travel destination and why? You know, I, I am looking forward to getting out for sure. It's been a long 18 months for uh, my family and I, uh, you know, my wife deserves it more than I do. Uh, my wife has been at home working uh, remotely uh, while being, you know, the principal and teacher in many, on many days for, uh, for my two young boys. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, we are keen to get out um, and travel here as soon as we can. Uh, we've been living vicariously through sports. Uh, and so I think, you know, my boys want to go and see some of the places they've been watching on TV on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, and so I think that's what you'll see us doing is, you know, family uh, vacations, uh, you know, to some of the sporting scenes that they, they're curious about. Uh, and Anything so in particular? Uh, I don't know how they get into it, but they, you know, they want to go see the Cleveland Browns, uh, mm -hmm. is one thing they want to go see. Uh, they want to see the New York Yankees, uh, you know, the baseball, uh, they're, they're quite captivated these days with, uh, hockey. Uh, mm -hmm. and so unlikely we'll have a chance to do that, but, uh, uh, you know, even going to, to, to Tampa Bay, which is the team they seem to be fascinated with. Uh, and so, and I want them to have fun. Uh, and I want, uh, it will be a, a family trip. I think, I think it's been trying, but I think the one thing we've learned is that we enjoy spending time with one another, but we need to, you know, spend time with Do one it outside another. the house. Somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere yeah. else. For the love of God, somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, guys, I really appreciate you taking the time for this. Um, uh, and, and, and thanks for your continued support and participation in Best Fleets. Uh, you, you as serving in this program and being part of this program has been a role model for others. And as a byproduct, you're helping to improve the industry. So thank you once again. And as you can see on my right, I guess your left, uh, your hat, the Transpro hat, 
will be a permanent fixture on my wall behind me. So uh, we love thanks it. for sending that along. So That's good. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris. It was wonderful. Great. Thanks for having us. I think you've got a great program and uh, thanks for uh, allowing us to be part of it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Perfect. Well, there you have it. Another great conversation with two fine leaders from the trucking industry. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe either via YouTube or your favorite podcast app and definitely rate us either via YouTube as well as your Apple podcast. Until next time, stay safe.